Good morning, students. <clears throat> Today is Wednesday, the 10th of February, 2021. Uh, this is the first of two lectures this week. One week from tomorrow will be our first exam. It's the 18th of February, and that means that tomorrow I will post um, what I call a sampling of examination questions. I will post it on Canvas. You should take a close look at it. Um, it'll, it's designed to give you an idea of the kind of questions that I ask on my exam, so you won't be shocked or surprised. <clears throat> the answers are provided at the end of the handout, so make sure you check your work. Um, if you miss any of the 10 questions, go back and study the book or <clears throat> my videos or examine your notes. Make sure you understand why the answers are as they are. Um, if you still can't figure it out after trying, you can send me an email and I'll explain it to you. Um, now, it's in your interest to memorize the answers because some of the questions may appear on the exam, and maybe many of them, maybe even all of them. So um, if that's the case, then in effect you're getting free points, but only if you remember the answers. So. Tomorrow, sample questions, one week from tomorrow, the exam. Now, we're going to be meeting three more times on video before the exam. Today, and probably two days from now, Friday, and then once next week before the exam uh, is given. So I'll tell you more about the exam as we go along. Today, we're going to get started on Chapter 3. In fact, we're going to finish Chapter 3 before the first exam. We're not going to cover all of Chapter 3, but we will be covering the first three sections. The first three sections state objections to U sub 7, or Act Utilitarianism, and they all were raised by Mill himself. So make sure by the next lecture you have read the section entitled The Too High for Humanity Objection. Today we're going to cover the Doctrine of Swine Objection. And the first day next week, before the exam, we'll cover the Lack of Time Objection. So, three different objections. All of them were raised by Mill himself, which may strike you as odd. Why would Mill, who is himself a utilitarian, raise objections to his own theory? Well, the, the reason is he knows that these objections are out there, he knows that they will be made by others, so why not respond to them in the very work in which he sets out the theory? And there's another reason why he does this. In the course of, of, of replying to the objections, Mill helps to clarify and sharpen the theory. So we understand his theory better by considering his replies to the various objections that he raises. And by the way, these are not the only three objections that he discusses in his little book. He discusses five, six, seven of them, quite a few. So <clears throat> Feldman just picked out three of the more prominent objections for discussion in his book. <clears throat> okay, let's get started on what's called the Doctrine of Swine Objection. In some ways, this might be called the Too Low for Humanity Objection which would contrast it with the second objection, which is called the too high for humanity objection. So let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to the handout that we went over together that's been posted on Canvas called Jeremy Bentham's Philosophic Calculus. Remember that with all the pluses and minuses and all the numerals? The purpose of that handout was to show you how a utilitarian goes about calculating utilities. You must take into account all of the pains and pleasures that your act um, creates or causes. And the right act is whichever act of those currently available to you produces the greatest net balance of pleasure over pain. So let's just continue to call that Bentham's philosophic calculus or Bentham's calculating machine. Now, critics pointed out when they read Bentham, critics pointed out that this theory takes into account only pleasure and pain. 
And since animals, as well as humans, are capable of experiencing pleasure and pain, it appeared to many critics that Bentham's theory reduced human beings to the status of animals by emphasizing only our capacity to feel pleasure or to feel pain, critics thought that it turned us into animals. And surely, the critic says, we are more exalted than that. We human beings are capable of exalted things like virtue. We're capable of acting on principle. We're capable of following moral rules. We're capable of many things that animals are not capable of. And yet it seemed to the critics as though Bentham was lowering our status down to the level of animals, in, in particular to pigs. Now keep in mind, maybe you don't know much about pigs. I grew up with aunts and uncles and cousins who had farms, and one of them had, a, had raised hogs. So I did spend some time around pigs, and I can tell you that pigs don't mind being dirty, as humans typically do. Uh, pigs, in fact, love to wallow in the mud, and it gives them pleasure. I think it probably helps keep mosquitoes and other insects off them. But they just love wallowing, rolling around in the mud, and they don't mind being dirty. So let's assume, for the sake of discussion, that pigs derive pleasure from wallowing in the mud. Um, the doctrine of swine objection says that Bentham has turned us into pigs, into swine, so that the only goal of our lives is the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. So I hope you can get a feel for what this objection, what motivates this objection. In fact, Feldman quotes Mill on page 30. So if you would, turn to page 30 of the book. Um, according to Feldman, Mill introduces the first objection by admitting that some of his opponents, or what I'm calling critics, feel, quote, inveterate dislike, unquote, for the utilitarian doctrine. And here's what Mill actually wrote. To suppose that life has, as they express it, no higher end than pleasure, no better and nobler object, of desire and pursuit, they designate, they referring to the opponents or critics, they designate as utterly mean and groveling, as a doctrine worthy only of swine. Now the word mean is one of those words that has more than one meaning. Uh, in this context, Mill means, by the word mean, he means mediocre or average, middling, Okay, it doesn't mean angry, like when you say somebody's mean to somebody else, abusive or angry. So what Mill is saying is the critics say that utilitarianism is a, is a mediocre theory. It doesn't expect much of us. It says that all we should be doing all the time is pursuing pleasure, not just our own pleasure, but pleasure generally, and avoiding pain. And that, they say is a doctrine worthy only of swine, pigs, or other animals. Okay, so the critics are criticizing Mill and Bentham for putting forward a theory that has the effect of reducing us to animals. So let's take a look at what Feldman calls the doctrine of swine objection. And I want to spend a little time on this today because most of the objections in the rest of the book have the same form as this one. So I want you to start getting familiar with the form. And I should tell you in advance that the form is known as modus tollens, M-O-D-U-S, which is Latin for mode or mode of, and tollens, T-O-L-L-E-N-S, tollens. And that means denying. So modus tollens is the Latin name for this type of argument this argument form, and it's in the denying mode, which is why it's called modus tollens. Now, several days ago, I posted on Canvas for you a handout entitled Modus Tollens. It goes on for four or five pages, so you need to read that handout slowly and carefully. You need to study it because some of the exam questions will be drawn from the handout. So, I'm not going to go all over the handout 
here today in my lecture. That's why I made the handout. It's a, it's a supplementary, supplementary material for you, okay, to supplement my lecture and to supplement Feldman, because Feldman doesn't talk a lot about the argument form. He, he just assumes that you know that it's a valid argument form. Now, let me explain what it means for an argument or argument form to be valid as opposed to invalid. Validity, validity has to do with the form of the argument, not with the content of it. So validity doesn't have anything to do directly with the actual truth or falsity of the premises or the conclusion of the argument. Validity has to do with the relation between the premises and the conclusion. Now there are certain arguments such that if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. And what makes that the case is the argument's form. So some arguments have that good valid form and some do not. The ones that do not we will call invalid or fallacious. So it's important that you remember, first of all, that modus tollens is a valid argument form. And that, once again, means if its premises are true, its conclusion must be true. There's no way to avoid it. The truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. And that's a good feature of an argument. If you are making an argument designed to persuade someone of something, then surely you would want to make a valid argument rather than an invalid argument. Now, validity is not the only thing we want when we argue. We also want our premises to be true. And we have a special word in philosophy and in logic to describe arguments that, are, that have two desirable characteristics. First, they're valid, and I just explained what that means. And second, all of their premises are true. All of them, however many premises there happen to be, all of them are true. And the special name we give to arguments like that is sound. A sound argument is an argument that has two features. It's valid and all of its premises are true. Now, some arguments fail that test and we call them unsound. And since there are two components to a sound argument, there are two ways for, a, for an argument to be unsound. The first way for an argument to be unsound is that it's invalid. It has a bad form. The second way for an argument to be unsound is that it has one or more false premises. All it takes is one false premise to make an argument unsound. Now you could have an argument that has both of those bad features. It could be invalid and it could have one or more false premises. And we would have to say, it's doubly unsound, or that it's unsound in two different ways. So, think of it this way. If you're making an argument, you should strive to make it valid and make sure that all of your premises are true. If you're criticizing someone else's argument, you have a couple of things to do. You can try to show that the argument is invalid, or you can try to show that one or more of its premises is actually false, or both. If you can do both, then you should. So let's take a look at this argument, the doctrine of swine objection, which is posed as an argument or presented as an argument, and let's look at the structure of it. I want you to see that it's an, it's an instance or example of modus tollens arguing. Okay, this is from page 32. This is verbatim from Feldman's page 32. If you want to pause the video and get your book out or the printout of the book that I posted on Canvas, do so now. Okay, page 32. Notice that this objection has two premises followed by a conclusion. The first premise is an if-then sentence. It says if P, comma, then Q, where the letters P and Q are simply variables for statements or propositions. So the first premise of a modus tollens argument says, if proposition P is true, then proposition Q is true. 
Another way to think of it is that the first premise of a modus tollens argument says that P implies Q. The, the, the proposition P implies proposition Q. Okay? The second premise of modus tollens denies the Q part, the part that follows the word then. So the second premise of modus tollen says not Q. The conclusion of modus tollens denies the first part of the first premise, the P part. It says not P. So notice modus tollens means denying mode and now you know why. Two of its premises are denials of something. The second premise denies the Q part, which is called the consequent of the if-then sentence, and the conclusion denies the P part, which is called the antecedent of the first premise, which is the if-then premise. So let's put it all together. Modus, a modus tollens argument has the form premise one, if P then Q, premise two, not Q, conclusion three, not P. You've got to remember the form of a modus tollens argument. There will be at least one question on the exam testing your knowledge of that. Don't confuse modus tollens with other argument forms that are similar but not the same, not identical. For example, tell me whether the following argument form is an example of modus tollens. You ready? If P then Q, not P, therefore not Q. Is that modus tollens? No. Notice the second premise denies the P part and the conclusion denies the Q. In modus tollens it's the other way around. The second premise denies Q, the conclusion denies P. So somebody might easily confuse those two argument forms but they're not at all the same. In fact modus tollens is valid I've told you that already today. The, the second one I just gave you is invalid. In fact, it has a name. It's called the fallacy of denying the antecedent because the second premise, which says not P, denies the antecedent of the first premise, which is P. So you mustn't confuse those two arguments. There's another, let me give a couple more. Tell me whether this is modus tollens. If P then Q, P, therefore Q. Is that modus tollens? Nope. First of all, there's no nothing being denied in that argument form. It goes if P, then Q, P, therefore Q. No denial. So it can't be modus tollens. Now, that, that argument form may still be valid, even though it's not modus tollens, and in fact it is. It's a valid argument form. It's called modus ponens, P-O-N-E-N-S. And ponens is Latin for affirming. So modus ponens is in the affirming mode. Once again, it goes if P then Q, P therefore Q. That's modus ponens and that's a valid argument form. So modus ponens and modus tollens are both valid. They preserve truth. What that means is that if their premises are true, their conclusion must be true. There's one more, just to, for the sake of completeness. What if I said, if P, then Q, Q, therefore P. Is that modus tollens? No. Is that modus ponens? No. Because notice I switched the Q and the P around. They had the same first premise, if P then Q, but whereas modus ponens goes P, therefore Q, the one I just gave you said Q, therefore P. That's not the same as modus ponens. In fact, that one is called the fallacy of affirming the consequent, because Q, the second premise affirms Q, which is the consequent of the first premise. So we have four argument forms, it, they could all be confused with one another. Modus tollens is one of the four. 
It's the one that you will see repeatedly in this book from now on. It's a valid argument form. You will learn to recognize it because it, it, has, it keeps cropping up. The basic idea of a modus tollens argument is to try to refute somebody's theory. In this case, utilitarianism. So let's read the doctrine of swine objection, which has the form of a modus tollens argument, and you'll see how it works. This is from page 32 of Feldman. Here we go. First premise. If U7, remember U sub 7 is our final formulation of act utilitarianism, the one that we think Mill had in mind. If U sub 7 were true, now you could rephrase that if you want. You could say if U sub 7 is true, put it in the indicative sense rather than the subjunctive tense. If U sub 7 is true, then notice the word then was left out, but it's implicit. It's understood to be there. So I'm going to, I'm going to state it explicitly. Sorry, I keep interrupting myself. Let's start over. If U sub 7 is true, then the only morally relevant considerations would be how much pleasure and pain an act and its alternatives would produce. That does seem correct, doesn't it? Based on what I've taught you about Bentham's philosophic calculus, it does appear as though U sub 7 implies that only the amount of pleasure and pain matter, because that's all we looked at in that handout, remember? What we looked at was the quantity of pleasure produced by each act and the quantity of pain produced by each act. So this premise would seem to be true, wouldn't it? It does seem as though if U sub 7 is true, then only the amounts of pleasure and pain are morally relevant. They're the only things that matter as far as whether the act is right or wrong. Now here's what the critic says as premise number two. Remember, this is a, an argument made by a critic or opponent of utilitarianism. The critic now says, but it's not true that only the quantity of pleasure and pain matter. Other things matter as well. Things like whether the act is virtuous, whether it's natural, whether it's harmonious. Lots of candidates have been offered for what makes an act right or wrong. And so the critic says that it's false that only the amount of pain and pleasure matter. Other things like virtue or harmony or naturalness, other things matter as well, or instead of pleasure and pain. Now, what follows from these premises? Notice the first premise has what form? It has the form if P, then Q. The second premise, if you look at it, has the form not Q. It starts with, it is not the case that. That is a way of denying something. And if you look and see what it's denying, it's denying the Q, the Q part of premise number one. So the first two premises of this argument go, if P, then Q, and not Q. What follows from those premises by modus tollens? Not P. Now take a look at this argument. Is that what you have here? It says U7 is not true. In other words, it's not the case that U7 is true. Or it's false that U7 is true. And that is the denial of P. So what we have here is a particular flesh and blood instance of the skeletal form known as modus tollens. If P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. So given that this is of the form modus tollens, which is a valid argument form, this is a valid argument. So Mill, notice Mill will not like the conclusion of this argument. What is the conclusion of this argument? U sub 7 is not true. It would, will Mill accept that? No. It says his theory is not true. 
Obviously, Mill will resist that if he possibly can. So here we have an argument made by a critic of utilitarianism. The conclusion is that utilitarianism is false or not true. We'll, we'll use false to mean not true. The conclusion of this argument is that utilitarianism is not true. That conclusion follows validly from the premises. So what does Mill have to do to avoid accepting that conclusion? He has to reject either the first premise or the second premise. He has to, because if he accepts both premises, then he has to accept the conclusion. Why? Because it's a valid argument. So Mill is in a corner. Mill, in order to avoid accepting this conclusion, has to show that the first premise is false or the second premise. And he gets to choose. He can, he can go either way. Now, one of the things I explained on my handout, which I won't repeat here, well, I'll repeat it, but I'm not gonna go into it in any detail because you can read the handout for yourself. There are colorful names for each of these two strategies that I just mentioned. When you deny or reject the first premise of a modus tollens argument, you are said to grab the bull by the horn or grasp, grasp the bull by the horn. And I'll spare you the origin of that phrase. I guess maybe I'll say this, a bull is charging you and you don't want to be gored to death by the bull. What strategies are there for you to stay alive? One of them would be to grab the bull by one or both of its horns as soon as it reaches you, um, and then wrestle the bull to the ground to avoid being gored. There may be other things you can do. Maybe if you're particularly agile, when the bull reaches you, you can leap into the air between the bull's horns, landing on the bull's back and then rolling to the ground. That, that strategy is called escaping between the horns. And that doesn't really apply here with this argument. So just remember grabbing or grasping the bull by the horn. That's what you are doing when you reject the first premise of a modus tollens argument, which is the if-then premise. What you're saying in effect is this. The first premise says that your theory has a particular implication. When you grab the bull by the horn, you deny that. What you're saying is, wait a minute now, my theory, correctly understood, does not have that implication. You, the critic, are mistaken. You think my theory has that implication, but it really doesn't. And let me explain to you why it doesn't. And you'll see that Mill uses this strategy all three times when he discusses all three of these objections that we'll be taking up in the days to come, Mill denies or rejects the first premise. He's a grasper. He likes to grasp the bull by the horn. And that means he's gonna to try to show the critic that the implication does not hold. The theory does not have that implication. Okay, there's a special colorful name for denying the second premise. If you deny the second premise of a modus tollens argument, you are said to bite the bullet. You're, you're a bullet biter. And that term originates in battlefield scenarios. If you have a wound, uh, if one of you, if you're wounded during a battle, you'll be taken to the medical area. And it may be that the surgeons determine that you must have your arm or leg cut off. And when they do that, it's gonna be very painful and it may be that they can't prevent the pain altogether, so they give you something to bite down on, typically a bullet, because bullets are made of soft lead. So if I give you a bullet, I may say, bite down hard because it's going to hurt like hell, and this will help you cope with the pain. So biting the bullet in a, in a philosophical sense means accepting something even though it's painful to do so. Right? You're going to put up with the pain. You're said to be biting the bullet. Okay, so let me review. And this is all discussed in great, at great length on my handout. When you reject 
the first premise of a modus tollens argument, you are said to be grasping or grabbing the bull by the horn. When you reject the second premise, you are said to be biting the bullet. So now that we've coined these two terms, which philosophers routinely use, uh, now that we've coined them, we can use them. I may say, for example, what's Bentham's strategy in dealing with this critical argument? Does Bentham bite the bullet or does he grab the bull by the horn? Sometimes Mill and Bentham employ the same strategy. Sometimes when they are confronted with an argument against their theory, they both grab the bull by the horn. Or it's also possible that they will both bite the bullet. But Bentham and Mill were not the same man. They were different people. And while they both subscribed to the same theory, they had different understandings of that theory, as you will see today, a little bit later. And so it's possible that when a particular argument is made, it's possible for Mill to employ one strategy and for Bentham to employ a different strategy. And that would show that they have different understandings of their theory. Okay? So this is the doctrine of swine objection. The critic says that the theory implies that only the amount of pain and pleasure matter. And the critic says that's not the case. Therefore, the theory must be rejected. The theory is false or simply not true. Now, we use modus tollens reasoning on a regular basis, and I'm sure you have. You probably don't even know it. Imagine somebody saying the following. If the Kansas City Chiefs are the best team in the NFL, then I'm a monkey's uncle. Have you ever heard people use that kind of phrase, I, that I'm a monkey's uncle? When people say that, they're using modus tollens reasoning. Here's the argument. If the Kansas City Chiefs are the best team in the NFL, then I'm a monkey's uncle. That's an if-then sentence. The implicit second premise is that I'm not a monkey's uncle. Anyone can see that. The conclusion is, therefore, that Kansas City is not the best team in the NFL. So when we say things like that, we're reasoning using modus tollens. Or how about this one? Suppose I come out and I find that my child, my grown child, has just changed the oil in my automobile. I might say, perhaps angrily, if I wanted you to change the oil, I would have told you to. Right? Maybe I'm exasperated. Oh, my goodness. If I wanted you to change the oil, I would have told you to. The second premise, which is unstated, is I didn't tell you to. The conclusion, therefore, is I didn't want you to change the oil. So the whole thing, when you put it all together, is premise number one, if I wanted you to change the oil, then I would have told you so. Second premise, I didn't tell you so. Conclusion, I didn't want you to change the oil. So this kind of reasoning is more common than you might think. We don't always state all of the parts, but they're simply understood by the person you're talking to. So let's now go back and talk a little bit about the quantity of pleasure and pain. I want to go back to Bentham's philosophic calculus briefly. Remember there that when we evaluated the various acts, a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, and so on, we looked at two things, how much pleasure each of those acts would bring about and how much pain each act would be about, bring about. Notice I just said how much. The goal is to quantify pleasure and pain. And ultimately, we will sum up the pleasures and pains and come up with a net pleasure. And the right act, according to Bentham, is to maximize net pleasure, which is pleasure minus pain. So utilitarianism, up till this point, has been purely quantitative. And that was Bentham's view of the theory. Bentham is known as a quantitative utilitarian quantitative utilitarianism. Bentham looked only at quantity, or how much pleasure and pain would be produced by each act. 
Bentham did not look at the quality of the pleasure or pain. He didn't ask whether the pleasure brought about by an act is high quality pleasure or low quality pleasure. To Bentham, that didn't matter at all. All he cared about is the quantity, quantity. Mill, who was, remember, Mill was Bentham's godson and protege. Mill was groomed to carry on Bentham's work. And he did indeed become a utilitarian. In fact, he wrote this little book that we're discussing right now called Utilitarianism. But as I said earlier today, Mill was not a slavish adherent of Benthamism. Mill was willing to deviate from Bentham's writings when he thought it was appropriate to do so. And this appears to be a case where, where Mill deviated from Bentham. So what does Mill believe? Does Mill believe that the quantity of pleasure and pain is irrelevant? No, please don't think that. For Mill, the quant quantity of pleasure and pain does matter. But something else matters in addition to that. And you probably can guess by now. It's the quality of pleasure and pain. Some pleasures, according to Mill, are of high quality. Some pleasures are of low quality. Obviously, we should count the high quality pleasures for more than we count the low quality pleasures. So Mill wanted to bring in a new consideration that Bentham resisted. And it's not as though Bentham hadn't thought of this, I assure you. Bentham thought of everything. Bentham, when he thought about introducing quality, rejected it. He said, no, it adulterates the theory. Why? Because the theory that Bentham left us is quantitative. It's a matter of, it's scientific. All we have to do is count up the pleasures and pains and then make a decision about what to do. If we bring quality into the picture, Bentham thought, we have adulterated the theory. We have added a foreign substance to it because now we're gonna get into endless squabbles. We utilitarians are gonna be squabbling endlessly about whether a particular pleasure is high quality or low quality. And Bentham thought that that would not serve the theory well. Better to just leave that out of the picture altogether. So you can see that, ben, that Mill brought in something that Bentham would not have approved of. But Mill stood his ground, and I'm sure if Bentham were to come back and read what Mill wrote, because Bentham was long dead by the time Mill wrote this book, I'm sure that if Bentham came back and read the book, he would have disapproved of what Mill did. I, I may be wrong, it's possible that Bentham would read what Mill wrote and say, hmm, good job, young man. We taught, your father and I taught you well. Uh, you've actually improved my theory by bringing quality into the picture. That's possible, I admit that. But I, having read a lot of Bentham and a lot of Mill, I'm pretty sure Bentham would not have approved. He would have said, young man, your father and I are disappointed in you for deviating from our beautiful quantitative theory. So why does Mill want to bring quality into, into the picture? Well, primarily to avoid the doctrine of swine objection. Mill did not want to reduce human beings to the status of pigs or other animals. Mill believed that human beings have an exalted status. Human beings have capacities that are beyond those of animals. Human beings, for example, can derive pleasure from reading a good book. No animal can derive that kind of pleasure. Human beings are capable of high quality, higher order pleasures, intellectual pleasures, like having a philosophical conversation with someone, reading a book of philosophy or history or mathematics. Right? Those are ple pleasant activities that only humans can engage in. What other kinds of pleasures are there besides bodily pleasures? There are aesthetic pleasures. Human beings can appreciate art. 
in a way that no animal can, or at least the, or we believe no animal can. Human beings can appreciate beautiful landscapes. Human beings can appreciate paintings, sculpture, drama, poetry, and many other art forms. So we derive pleasure that we can call aesthetic pleasure, the pleasure of contemplating art. No animal has that capacity. Human beings have the capacity to experience spiritual pleasures, pleasures of the spirit, pleasure contemplating God or the transcendent. Uh, we can call those spiritual pleasures. Uh, religious feelings like awe and reverence are pleasant feelings. And also moral pleasure. When you learn that some culprit, some bad person has been punished, probably you experience pleasure at the thought. It seems to you as though justice has been served, right? People, when people get their comeuppance, it brings pleasure, right? We can think of that as moral pleasure. When good people experience happiness, we take delight in that. It's a pleasant experience. When bad people suffer, we take delight in that. Right? We don't take delight in the suffering itself. We take delight in the fact that it's an evil person who deserves to suffer, who is suffering. So let me summarize. Human beings are capable of high quality pleasures, pleasures of the mind, which we can call intellectual pleasures, pleasures of art, experiencing art, which we can call aesthetic pleasures, pleasures of the spirit or religious pleasures, religious ecstasy and joy and awe. We, we, do, we humans can experience moral pleasure, pleasure at people getting what they deserve. We humans can also ex have experience bodily pleasures, right? We like taking a, a warm bath, especially on a cold day where you've been out in the cold, a hot shower. It feels good. We, we experience pleasure of a high quality, I'm sorry, bodily pleasure when we eat a good meal or when we drink when we're thirsty, uh, when we're having sex. These are bodily pleasures. And humans, of course, experience those just as animals do. So Mill's view is that, yes, we share something with animals. Both of us have the capacity to experience bodily pleasure. But we humans, in addition to that, have the capacity to experience more exalted pleasures of the intellect, our aesthetic, moral, spiritual. So Mill, unlike Bentham, wanted to bring into play the qualitative element of pleasure and of pain as well. Notice that pains can be ranked in terms of their quality uh, as well as their intensity, but mostly Mill focuses on the quality of pleasure. Um, <clears throat> now, a couple of other things illustrate the distinction between quantity and quality, and I'm sure they're familiar to you. Maybe you haven't thought of them in this way, but what about sleep? Um, we evaluate our sleep in two ways, how much sleep and how good, how, how high was the quality. There have been times when I got lots of sleep, plenty of sleep, but it was low quality sleep because I was tossing and turning. Maybe I had an ache or a pain that kept me from getting into a deep restful sleep. So I, if someone asked me, how was your sleep? I might say the quantity was good, but the quality was poor. Or it could be the other way around. Suppose I got only six hours of sleep, which means the quantity wasn't as high as it might have been. Maybe I ordinarily sleep eight hours, but this past evening I got only six hours. But maybe those six hours were deep and restful. So when I awoke, I felt refreshed and ready to go. So we, we evaluate sleep not only in terms of its quantity, how much sleep we got, but its quality, how restful was it. Another example is life itself. We evaluate people's lives in terms of their quantity and their quality. How long did somebody live? That's the first question we ask. Some people live a long time, like Thomas Hobbes, the philosopher. 
he lived to be 90. Immanuel Kant lived to be 80, uh, 80 years old. So both of them had long lives. Their, the quantity of their lives was high. Uh, other people, unfortunately, had a low quantity of life, small. The great British mathematician and philosopher Frank Ramsey died in his 20s. Uh, it's a terrible loss to the fields of mathematics and philosophy. He made tremendous contributions even into his 20s. Imagine if he had lived to be 50 or 60 or 70. Uh, our world, I assure you, would have been very different from what it is. He was a brilliant man and he died young, tragically. And many others have done so as well. So some people have high quantity of life, some have low quantity. What about quality? Uh, someone may live 90 years, but it may be a life filled with pain and suffering and tragedy and disappointment. Uh, we might say that the quantity was there, 90 years, but the quality was low, or not what it might have been. We might also say that someone like Frank Ramsey, who lived only, I think, 27 years, the quality of his life was extremely high in terms of his creativity, in terms of the uh, pleasures that he derived from his researches and his discoveries and so so forth. I think he was a mountain climber as well. In fact, he may have died while mountain climbing. So we would add that his life was rich and full, albeit short. So life and sleep are also examples of a distinction we make between quantity and quality. So Mill is not off his rocker when he talks about bringing quality into play, is he? He's saying, look, we, we look at the quality of things all the time. Why should we not look at the quality of pleasure the way we do it, the quality of sleep, the quality of life, and so on? Now, here's the thing you're probably wondering about. If quality matters, who gets to decide which pleasures have high quality and which have low quality. Do we want Mill to be the judge of that? I would say no, for the following reason. Mill says in his autobiography that he had very little uh, life of the body. He had a tremendous life of the mind. He was an intellectual but Mill was given such an intense education by his father and by Jeremy Bentham that he was deprived of many of the things that children ordinarily have. Mill says he had no, no uh, children to play with other than his brothers and sisters. He had no friends, no other kids to talk to or play games with. He had very few toys, if any. Uh, he, had, he, he was uncoordinated. He didn't play any sports. He didn't learn how to uh, exercise, no gymnastics. So Mill, as a child, was uncoordinated, physically um, inactive. So do we really, but Mill, Mill's mind was highly developed. In fact, Mill said in his autobiography that his intense early education gave him a 25 year advantage over his contemporaries. Think about that, what that means. Mill is saying that the age of 12, he, he knew as much and could do as much intellectually as, a, as someone who was 37, right? Add 25 years to 12, you get 37. So uh, Mill knew at 12 what a 37-year-old typically knows and could do what at 12, what a typical 37-year-old can do. It's, it's, it's staggering. So Mill was, had a tremendous intellect, but almost no uh, bodily um, coordination or movement. So Mill, I would suggest to you, would be a biased judge. If you asked Mill, to evaluate a particular bodily pleasure, such as the pleasures of shooting baskets, or jogging, or climbing a mountain, Mill would probably assign that a low quality because he has not experienced it, right? And he probably underestimates the quality of the pleasure that those activities involve. 
if you asked Mill what the, whether the pleasures of reading poetry are high or low, he would probably say very high because Mill has read poetry and enjoyed it and thought highly of it. So Mill would probably not be the person to ask if, you're, if your objective were to evaluate the quality of a particular pleasure. Here's what a philosopher wrote about Mill. When I read this, I laughed and I decided I better put this in my notes to tell my students. So here we go. This is Leonard Russell. He said, the activity of drinking beer at the pig and whistle and thumping the beer mug on the table while singing rowdy songs would not have appealed to Mill as even a minor incident in a way of life with any pretensions to quality. He would have thought that there were always activities available more worthy of an intelligent and cultivated person. And I concur wholeheartedly with that. Mill would have frowned on going out with your friends to a pub and having a few drinks and singing rowdy songs and living it up. Mill would say that is the most low quality pleasure imaginable. That really is the kind of pleasure a pig uh, or, or some other animal can experience. Mill would say there's little or no intellectual content to that. Uh, so Mill would frown on that kind of pleasure and say, oh, low quality for that one. Um, so let's rule Mill out as the appropriate judge. Now, should we let, not to be disparaging, but should we let Joe Blow decide? By Joe Blow, I mean a typical average guy or woman, Josephine Blow. Is that the appropriate judge of quality? I would suggest the answer is no, once again. And the reason is, while Joe Blow may have ample experience with things like bowling and playing softball and uh, drinking with your friends uh, or watching television on the, on the couch, uh, Joe Blow may be perfectly equipped to tell you the quality of those things. Joe Blow has probably not been to an opera or read any poetry, or uh, thought hard about a philosophical puzzle, uh, or solved a philosophical puzzle. So for the opposite reason, we don't want Joe Blow to be the judge. We don't want Mill, because he's an elitist, E-L-I-T-I-S-T, elitist, and we don't want Joe Blow either. Now, he's too ordinary, too common. And you could probably guess what Mill's answer is. The, the proper judge of quality is someone who has experienced both types of pleasure. So let me turn my page in my notes. And here I'm going to read from my notes. Feldman quotes him on page 33 of the book. Here's Mill. Mill says, quote, one kind of pleasure is of higher quality than another kind of pleasure if and only if people who have experienced both kinds of pleasure, both kinds of pleasure, prefer the one to the other, unquote. So who are the appropriate judges? If we have two pleasures, this pleasure one and two, and we're wondering which of those two pleasures has the higher quality, whom should we ask? Not Mill, not Joe Blow, because Mill may not have experienced both types of pleasure, and Joe Blow may not have. The proper judge, Mill says, is someone who has experienced both types of pleasure. And what we should ask that person is, which type of pleasure do you prefer to the other? In fact, we shouldn't just ask one person. We should ask as many as we can and take a tally so Mill says all, what does he say, um, most people. Mill says if and only if most people. Now that's vague. Does that mean more than half? Does that mean two-thirds or three-quarters? Does it mean 90%? It's not clear. I would suggest it means at least half, right? more than half. So here's a little test I came up with years ago, and I, I think it, 
might be endorsed by Mill. Suppose you had two pleasures in mind and you wanted to know which of them had the higher quality. Let's, let's use one of Bentham's examples, push pin and poetry. Now you know what poetry is. Push pin, for a long time I thought it was pin the tail on the donkey because there's, you push a pin into a, into a wall or something. But I looked, I looked into it and I think push pin was not pin the tail on the donkey. It was a children's game, where you, a board game where you push pins into holes like cribbage or something like that. And it was a children's game, push pin it's called. So we have push pin and poetry. And people derive pleasure from playing push pin and they derive pleasure from reading poetry. Which has the higher quality? Suppose you wanted to find out. Here's what you might do. Go to a shopping mall, and I guess you, this would have to be pre or post COVID when there were actually people out there in a mall, you go to a shopping mall, you get a clipboard with a pen. And on, on your paper, you have a line down the middle, and you have push pin on one side at the top and poetry on the other side at the top. <clears throat> Here's how you would go about this. You would approach someone in the mall and politely ask and politely say, excuse me, do you have a moment to answer a survey now, the person may say, no, I'm busy, I'm in a hurry, thank you, and you say, thank you for your time. Someone might say, yes, I do have a moment for a survey. Okay, so here's the first thing you ask. Have you ever played push pin? Now, the answer will be either yes or no. If the answer is no, then you, this person is not going to be qualified to determine the quality because we're looking for people who've experienced both of these things. So if the person says no, immediately say, thank you for your time. Okay, what if the person says, yes, I have played push pin? Next question, have you read poetry? If the answer is no, then you've got to say, thank you for your time and move on. But what if the person who's already told you I've played push pin now answers, yes, I have read poetry. Now you've got someone, right? Now you should ask that person, which of those two pleasures do you judge to be of the higher quality? And it's going to be either, well, there are three possibilities. You could, the person could say push pin had a higher quality than poetry. Poetry had a higher quality than push pin, or it was a tie. Let's rule the tie out because it's probably unlikely. It could happen, but unlikely. So if the person says push pin, put a mark on that side of your sheet. If the person says poetry, put a mark on that side of the sheet under poetry. Now you might want to keep going with this for several hours and you may have some goal like a hundred respondents. Suppose you get a hundred marks on your sheet. Count them up. What if it comes out 50-50? 50, 50, 50 of the respondents who have exper experienced both pleasures judge push pin to be preferable to poetry and the other 50 judged poetry to be preferable to push pin. Is that enough to satisfy Mill's test? I would suggest no, because he says most people, those are his own words. What if it comes out 60 to 40, one way or another? 60, 40, is that does that constitute most? Well, again, it's vague, maybe not. But what if it comes out 90 to 10? That's pretty clearly most. What if 90 people said poetry is of a higher quality than push pin, and only 10 said push pin is of a higher quality than poetry? 90 to 10, I think Mill would say there we have pretty good evidence that poetry, the pleasure derived from reading poetry, is of a higher quality than the pleasure derived from playing push pin. So there is Mill's test. That's how you might implement it. Now Feldman points out that there are problems with Mill's test. I'm not so sure there are problems, but here's what he says on page 33. Feldman says that there's a practical problem. Quote, 
there's no clear method by which the quality rating of a given kind of pleasure can be determined. He also says on page 34, Mill's test is, quote, very hard to apply, unquote. Now, I'm not so sure that's true. I just gave you a way, a practical way, to go about finding out which of two pleasures is of the higher quality. So I'm not impressed by what Feldman just said here. Feldman says there are practical problems involved in implementing this test. I'm not so sure of that. Feldman also says that there are conceptual problems with Mill's test. Here's what he says on page 34. It's not clear that it makes any sense to say that one pleasure is twice as high in quality as another. Well, that's probably true. We don't typically rank qualities in terms of um, twice as high, three times as high. We don't try to assign numerical values to qualities. Usually what we do is rank things in terms of their quality, uh, as we just did. We rank poetry reading as being of higher quality than playing pushpin. But we didn't try to quantify it, did we? We didn't say that, uh, <clears throat> that reading poetry is three times higher in quality than playing pushpin. We didn't do that. We just ranked one over the other. It was called a it's called an ordinal ranking, not a cardinal ranking. Now, you don't need to remember that for the exam. But quality rankings are, and, and this, I think, is what Feldman's point is. Quality rankings are ordinal. They give us the order or ranking from top to bottom, but they don't tell us the units in between them. Are there five units in between these two, ten between the next pair, and so on? Okay, that would be a cardinal ranking. So, take it for what it's worth. Feldman thinks that Mill's test suffers from two different kinds of problems, practical and conceptual. I'm pretty sure the practical problems are solvable or soluble. Maybe the conceptual problems are not soluble, and we don't need to go any further into that. But that might be a problem for Mill, let's put it that way. Okay, the only other thing I want to say today, oh, let's go back to the argument, and I'll show you what Mill says in reply to it now. Okay, go back to the Doctrine of Swine Objection on page 32. Remember, it's modus tollens. It's therefore valid. Mill rejects the conclusion, which means that Mill has to do one of two things. Grasp the bull by the horn and reject the first premise, or bite the bullet and reject the second premise. In fact, Mill accepts the second premise. Let's read it. Here's what the second premise says. It's not the case that the only morally relevant considerations are how much pleasure and pain the act and its alternatives would produce. Mill agrees with that, doesn't he? Mill would say, absolutely right. Pleasure, the quantity of pleasure and pain are not the only things we should look at. So Mill accepts the second premise. Well, now he's really painted himself into a corner because we've got a valid argument. Mill rejects the conclusion. He accepts the second premise. He's got to reject the first premise. He's got to grab the bull by the horn. And that's exactly what he does. What does that mean? It means that Mill is telling the critic, wait a minute, you, utilitarianism does not have the implication you say it does. You are simply misunderstanding my theory. Right? Your first premise, the if-then premise, says, if my theory is true, then only the quantity of pleasure and pain matter. That's not the case. My theory does not have that implication. As I have just explained, my theory implies that something in addition to quantity matters, namely quality. So Mill's response to the doctrine of swine objection is not to bite the bullet, not to challenge the validity of the argument, because that would be truly foolish, but to deny the first premise, which means grasping the bull by the horn. So you need to remember that. I could ask you on the, on the exam. Mill's strategy with respect to the doctrine of swine objection is to bite the bullet, true or false. You should know by now that's false. 
Or what if I said Nil's strategy is to grasp the bull by the horn? True. Okay. Now, one more thing before we're done, because we're already a little over an hour in. Nil gives an interesting example of, a, of an old woman who is dying, calling her two nephews to her bedside. She's got a lot of money, and she needs to give the money to someone. And suppose her goal is to produce the greatest amount of pleasure for the world. The, she asks the nephews, what will you do with the money if I give it to you? The first nephew says, I would like to do research into the origins of the universe. That research will bring about a certain amount of pleasure for those who can appreciate the beauty of the cosmos and so on. Um, the second nephew says, I'm going to have a fantastic party with lots of people invited. We're going to have drinks and dancing and music and party favors and everything else. Now, according to Feldman, we, let's assume that the duration of the pleasure is the same. He assigns the value 75. Right? The, the pleasure will last the same amount of time for both of these activities. Okay, the research and the partying. The intensity of the pleasure will differ. In the case of the research, we will assign it an intensity factor of 25. Okay, the intensity is comparatively low. Right, the pleasure is intellectual pleasure. In the case of the partying, the intensity of the pleasure gets assigned 50 because they're going to be having a good old time dancing and carousing and getting drunk and so on. Now, if all we looked at was intensity and duration, those are the two things that give us the quantity, which nephew should the old woman give the money to? Well, you should multiply the duration by the intensity. If you multiply 75 by 25, you get, let me see in my notes here, you get four, 75 times 25, Hold on a second here. 75 times 25. Um, no, I know I had it here in my notes somewhere. There it is. It's 1,875. So the quantity of pleasure produced by giving the money to the nephew who wants to do research will be 800, 1,875. The quantity of pleasure produced by giving the money to the partying nephew will be 75 times 50. And that comes out to 3,750, twice as much. So if the old woman looked only at quantity, which is what Bentham recommends, she would give the money to the partying nephew because there will be more overall pleasure by doing that. Now, how would Mill examine this example? Mill would say that something has been left out. We've got duration of pleasure, intensity of pleasure. Mill would say, yes, we must count those. Absolutely. We still need to look at the quantity. But Mill wants to bring in quality, something Mill Bentham would not want. Mill assigns a quality scale to the two activities. The research has high quality. That's an intellectual pleasure, contemplating the wonders of the cosmos and the mathematical equations that describe the physical world. Mill assigns a quality of 25 to that. The quality of the partying is very low. That's like being in the pub and singing rowdy songs and banging your beer mug on the table. Feldman assigns only two quality units to that one. So what do you do? You multiply the duration, intensity, and quality factor to get the end result. So 25, I'm sorry, 75 times 25 times 25 for the quality gives us 46,875 units, hedons of pleasure for the nephew who wants to do the research. If you multiply 75 by 50 by 2, 
you get 7,500 for the nephew who wants to have a big party. And there's really no comparison. Once you bring quality into the picture, which is what Mill wants to do, it turns out that the right thing to do for the old woman is to give the money to the nephew who wants to do the research because that will produce high quality pleasure, vastly higher in quality than the transient low quality pleasure of a party, which may produce hangovers that would offset the pleasure of the night before. So according to Feldman, page 35, U sub 7 implies that, quote, the old woman should use the money to support the research, not the celebration, not the party. So I hope by now that you can see that this is an interesting case uh, because not I'm not talking about the old woman case. Uh, the doctrine of swine objection is an interesting case because Mill and Bentham, while they are both utilitarians, have different understandings of the theory. For Bentham, it's quantity only that matters. For Mill, it's quantity plus quality. And one more thing before I leave you for today. Go back to the doctrine of swine objection. We saw a moment ago that Mill grabs the bull by the horn. Mill says to the critic, the problem with your argument, critic, is that your first premise is false. My theory does not have the implication that you say it does. Bentham responds to this critical argument in a different way. Bentham bites the bullet. Remember, that means denying the second premise of a modus tollens argument. So the second premise of this argument goes like this. It is not the case that the only morally rele relevant considerations are the quantity of pleasure and pain. What do you get when you deny that? You have to take the it is not the case part off, leaving the following. The only morally relevant considerations are how much pleasure and pain an act and its alternatives would produce. And that's precisely Bentham's view, isn't it? Bentham, unlike Mill, says only quantity matters. So he rejects the second premise. So Mill and Bentham have different strategies for responding to the same objection. All right, that's enough for the doctrine of swine objection. Let's discuss on the next video the too high for humanity objection, and then we'll have one objection to do next week before the exam. Okay, so continue uh, reading and rereading the text. Um, make sure you watch these videos um, with, your, with full attention. Don't have music playing or other distractions. Make sure you're listening to what I'm saying, making notes as you go. The nice thing is you can watch what I say more than once if you want, and also make good notes, both on, your, on the reading material and on my videos. And don't forget the handouts, especially that handout called Modus Tollens. Read it carefully. I explained things as clearly as I could. Um, I talked a lot about what I covered today in this video, the form of Modus Tollens, the, the, the names that we give to the various strategies to reply to a Modus Tollens argument, and so on. Okay. We're an hour and 13 minutes in. That's enough for today. See you um, in a couple of days.